Thank you, uh, everybody, for, for being here with us today for the, I think this is the seventh, maybe sixth, someone can correct that for me later if I'm wrong, in our series of Reconstruction and its Legacies in Alabama for, um, for this year's Cultural Crossroads. Uh, we are um, being, I was going to say, coming to you today from Landmark, um, but, but in fact, I'm, I'm coming to you from, uh, this is sponsored by Landmarks Foundation of, of Montgomery um, and funded by um, our, our wonderful partners at the Alabama Humanities Alliance, to whom we're, we're so grateful. And uh, we are continuing the series today with uh, a really important and, and fascinating talk. Uh, and both for, for Black Alabamians and, and white consumers inside and, and out of the South, the, the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, the Klan, right, took on a central role in, in the perception of Reconstruction as it was unfolding. And, you know, historians still debate about the actual numbers of this, this kind of newly formed collective, this newly formed club of white racial terrorists. Um, but, but regardless of the numbers, they're really sort of self-crafted legend and their, their media crafted legend really loomed large. And one of the ways that it that principally did that was through this category of visual evidence of engravings and especially of, of photographs that sort of promised to its viewers to the, the truth of this mysterious phenomenon that's unfolding during Reconstruction. So to put all this into, con into, uh, into context, I'm delighted to, to welcome to our series um, the historian of, of Alabama photography, Francis Osborne Robb. And, and Francis is the author of the award winning ooh, Shot in Alabama, A History of Photography, um, 1839 to 1941, which came out um, from UA Press, I think, in 2000, University of Alabama Press, I think, in uh, 2010. And, and she was for decades has been a curator, researcher, and consultant for a variety of museums and other cultural heritage uh, organizations. She's also, I should add, uh, the matriarch of a distinguished family of, of art historians and curators, including her son, Andrew, who helped us to put this together today. Uh, so uh, over her, her career, I think Frances has been the person most responsible for introducing us not just to the history of the photograph in Alabama, but to the things these objects can reveal to us about the people and places where they were made and, and of whom they depict. And I think photographs, as Francis would remind us, are small windows into larger histories. Uh, and really, I can think of, of no better topic um, to illustrate that point, the absolutely fascinating material that she's going to talk about today. So uh, I'm going to talk for just a minute more, but I want to pause just briefly and, and welcome uh, Francis here. Thank you for being with us, Francis. So um, during Reconstruction, one of the most prominent and, and popular pieces of what historians um, call decorative arts, right, was the, the photograph. We can think of decorative arts as, as objects, right? Um, exactly what they sound like, things that people have for no reason other than that they are decorative. And the Civil War really helped to, to revolutionize the production, distribution, and sale of photographs. And in this commercial enterprise and social practice really only grew in the reconstruction period. In, in particular, what we started seeing from, um, uh, you know, people that would sell stationery, stationers were, were um, albums that were designed to hold these, these small photographs, uh, cartes de visite um, or visiting cards which were, were tiny, about the size of a, a contemporary business card. And what they would be for was to sort of serve as mementos of family members or other loved ones, people that you wouldn't necessarily visit on a daily basis, but could be reminded of daily as you're sort of flipping through these, um, these albums that you would keep. And these were really, really important in the larger context of, of the history of material and visual culture of the decorative arts, 
um, because they could be printed in multiples, because they were small, and because they were cheap. So earlier photographs um, um, called either case photographs as a, a sort of general category, um, uh, and more specifically were things like daguerreotypes, amber types, ferrotypes, or, or tin types, all things that um, that, that people who have seen photographs from the 19th century are probably familiar with. Those are the, the kind of cased um, photos you can see in the image on screen. Um, but paper print photographs, the, the ones that would go in the album, um, are, were ones that could be replicated time and time again, right? They weren't just one-offs like, like earlier cased photos. Um, and, and as long as, as the negative existed, sometimes for decades, you could reprint these. Um, and, and this allowed for people to go back to, um, to photographers uh, and, and get things reprinted and keep them as these kind of family heirlooms. So all this is made context for, for the image Francis is going to talk to us uh, uh, about today. And I wanna quickly give the, the, the really specific history of, of how this, this came about. Um, Frances, for, I know from talking uh, to her in the past few weeks, she's been telling me this fascinating story uh, about this particular photograph, which she's been aware, of, it's taken in Huntsville, and which she's been aware of for about uh, 20 years, uh, and, is, and has spent much of that time researching its origins. So she found this photo when she was um, helping a friend sort through a collection of old family photographs. And, and most of them were exactly the things you'd expect, right? Uh, the things you'd expect if you sorted through family photographs taken in the late 19th century or the late 20th. They were um, people sort of stiffly dressed up in their Sunday best posing for the photographer, right? And, and then, and then the, the photograph um, that, that represents the kind of serendipity that historians dream about, right? Fell out of this album that Francis is looking at. And it was this photograph, um, very different from its fellows. This photo showed two figures, as you can kind of see here on the left, described, disguised in wrappers, basically a, a bathrobe um, from the 19th century. Uh, and, and that's where the story really begins. And so I want to turn this out now over, after I've talked entirely too much, I want to turn this now over to, to Frances. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a fun subject to talk about because a lot of people think the Civil War was the period of great photography in this country, and it was, but it was great repetitive photography in this country because uh, there were limitations to the cameras you could mostly take pictures of dead people um, or people who were going off to their deaths that you didn't know about at that point. But the Reconstruction really was a tangled web of history that mingled all kinds of different aspects. And it was distressing to of most people who lived through it in the South. And at the same time, photography flourished. It, it had opportunities that it would not have had if it hadn't been for the war. And one of them has happened to me. I was helping a friend uh, sort out some photographs that belonged to her late husband, who was a preservation architect and had pictures of old houses all over the Southeast that he had worked on to, sa to salvage them. So we were picking out the ones we wanted to keep for her a personal collection and the ones that would go to an archive. And all of a sudden a photograph fell out of an album and it was virtually what you see in front of you, except that it was a copy print. I could tell that it was on modern paper and there were various things about it that told me what it was. But I was writing a book at the time on Alabama's history, uh, history of photography. And I was struck by the picture and how unusual it was. Most people have their heads bare. Uh, they're showing off their teeth to the camera and they look as if they're about to meet the mayor at least, if not God himself. So uh, a picture of people who were masked and hooded was unusual to say the very least. So I asked her if I could use it in my book and she said, 
Oh, I feel a little uneasy about this. She said, this isn't my family. This is my husband's family. And his elderly aunts might be very distressed. Well, I could read her distress, so I didn't want to press it. So I didn't. And the pictures were packed up and disappeared from my sight. Some months later, one of the family members called me up and said that the real picture, the original, had turned up. So I wanted to see it, and it was indeed the original. And it had written on the back some information that suggested that one of the people in, in the picture was a relative of her husband, a minister of the Presbyterian Church who had belonged to the Ku Klux Klan. Well, I was very interested in that because the KKK didn't keep membership rules, so it's hard to find out uh, who belonged. And to know somebody who was a member was unexpected. But it was a Scotch verdict sort of story because there was no absolute proof as to who these people were in the first place, much less which ones might have belonged to the Klan. And there were other sort of disturbing things about the picture that made you think that it might not be a Scotch verdict anyway. It might not be Scots. Uh, for instance, one of the men is holding a pistol that's half again as large as the actual pistol would have been in the period. Another is wearing a, a wrapper, a sort of a bathrobe that puddles around his feet suggesting that the original wearer was much taller person to stretch his legs out in that outfit. So there were things that made it unlikely that the Scotch verdict held here and that the person was, these people were actually Presbyterians and one of them was a, a, a minister. So I put it aside and then looking on the internet, I changed my mind as I often do from looking at the internet because I started to see other prints of this very picture. And that was in itself unusual. Most people in Alabama only ordered the one picture that came with the set that they were, were working on. If it was a family group, it'd be pictures of each member of the family, but only one. The multiples were not common in the South partly because they were expensive, even though they seem cheap to us now. You could pay 25 cents for one of these pictures and it would be the equivalent of five or six dollars. So you were limited in how many you were willing to afford. Robinson and Murphy were photographers in Huntsville. They had both had careers elsewhere. And Mr. Uh, Robinson had been in uh, Elaton, Alabama, which becomes part of Birmingham. And so he had a checkered career of his own. Mr. Murphy was from Pulaski, where the Ku Klux Klan was founded. So these, these people had a little bit of a his history about them. And I got really excited when I found a picture in really good condition, the one you're looking at, um, in this family collection. It was an original that copies had been made from, but there were other copies in other institutions in the United States. Princeton University, for instance, has a wonderful clean copy that looks like it just came out of the photographer's dark room. Uh, so the pictures are scattered and I ended up with now 15 of them and they're not all the same. The one that you see here shows a KKK letters scratched into the emulsion of the film so that when it's printed, you see the letters. That helps us to identify what the scene is or what this people wanted you to think it was uh, because in the original that we have, the story is such that you know that, that there were other images. What happened was that three nights before the federal election that would put Ulysses S. Grant in the White House. The courthouse was the scene of a rally to get the vote out, the Republican vote out. The Republicans, if they won, were going to institute more of what were called radical reconstruction, a punitive measure against the South and its people that would have reverberating consequences throughout history.
So these people are having a rally in the building you're looking at here. It's not our present courthouse, which is hopelessly ugly, but this is a very beautiful Greek revival building that was built by a person who had had some architectural training. So all around the building were people standing, gossiping, discussing the rally, discussing the candidates. And Grant really, really needed the votes that were going to come out of Madison County. Alabama went for Grant for 6,000 votes. That's a tiny number is what was actually cast. And it was a, a jubilant feeling that they were going to win. So they're standing outside, they're talking and gossiping. And all of a sudden, into the corner of the square, you can't see it, but it's over to your right. That There's a road that leads to the railroad depot. Down that road came 150 or 200 um, masked riders and walkers to walk around the square in their disguises. The disguises, I have to remind you, the people didn't have the white ones that they have for the second plant in the 1915s and 1920s. They wore whatever was handy, and there were often these wrappers that were made out of leftover cloth or like, like Scarlett O'Hara made out of the, the curtains from the dining room. Uh, and they were made by, by wives and mothers and girlfriends and sisters. Uh, anybody could make one because they don't have uh, any uh, shape to them. They're just big p puffy things. And these you can see are uh, quite typical. Everybody's look different so that there's no way you could tell somebody belonged to the KKK if they showed up in a wrapper. They may just have gotten out of bed. Uh, but these wrappers, they have little prints on them if you look very carefully. And they are very typical of what the KKK wore in the early days. They are hooded and they are, their horses were disguised because people could recognize your horse probably before they could recognize you if they were seeing you come down the road. So these people came down from the depot, walked around the square holding their guns and they held their guns with their, in the, with their arms on the ends of the guns, and one on the muzzle, one on the end. And they didn't do anything threatening except look threatening. They held a, what was called a watching brief in one corner of the square. They lined up, looked menacing, and let people do what they wanted to do. What it did was to incite violence. All of a sudden, shots rang out from the courthouse lawn. 30 or 40 of them. And by the end of the episode, two men were dead and another one was mortally injured. So that was a excuse for the federal government to come and do uh, all kinds of investigating. But one of the investigations was led by a young man uh, named Campbell, Lafayette Campbell, who was from Indiana and he dropped out of his freshman year of college in order to join this, the um, go to war. And he fought in the Civil War, got out of the, the um, army at the end of the war, rejoined uh, in a much leaner, uh, meaner army uh, that was some of whom were posted to Huntsville to keep the peace. He was charged by his uh, superior officer with doing a report on the incident. And he reported that he had been walking down from the depot and he saw three men carrying their heavy saddles and carrying their disguises walking on a street near the courthouse. He went over to them and said, what are you doing here? Don't you know there's a curfew? And they said, we're hunting for quail which is a phrase in the 19th century that meant, mind your own business, mister, stay out of my way. Lafayette Campbell was looking to be promoted. He wanted to be a first lieutenant very badly. So he um, decided he would arrest them. 
So he called for the civil authority and the civil authority came and took them off to what Campbell called the calaboose, which was the, his word and a local uh, word from the de debased Spanish for, uh, <clears throat> for, for a jail. The jail was also on the square. Everything was on the square. The photographers, the courthouse, the KKK, Campbell, the courthouse is where things happen. So he took them off, put them in the calaboose. He didn't stop to think that the um, person who was the civil authority, the sheriff, was likely a diehard Confederate. And so he proved later on who let the people out the back window. And so when Campbell came to see his prisoners, there was only saddles left and only the costumes. What was he to do? Well, he couldn't have taken pictures of those people because camera technology is not good enough at the time. So what he did was move the costumes into the studio, grab a couple of guys, one of them may have been Campbell himself and posed them in the disguises for the, to make a picture, hopefully to show his, the people for whom he was writing the report that the event really had happened and there was really a result if it was only the costumes. It's what my husband calls a cover your ass photograph. A cover your ass photograph is sort of something that's done in the military and meant that people took care to present themselves in the best possible way so they wouldn't be penalized. And that's what cover your ass means. So these people posed and went away and went about their business. And the report went into uh, his superior officer and it survives miraculously as a photocopy of all things in a collection of archives in Indiana. One of the photographs that's in the collection is signed by two men. One of them is Mr. Campbell, who signed at the bottom in large letters. The other one is W.R. Blackman, who is, was the Surgeon General for that regiment. And he was a jokester of all kinds. And I, I believe that I've tracked his handwriting down to the point that I know that he wrote not only his name there, but he wrote those words, Yours Ku Kluxley. And yours Ku Kluxley is surtly a joke. He's meaning he's, that he's probably the, one of the men on the front who's dressed up in those, that weird costume. Could we see the next one? There'll be another one in a minute. There we go. This is a photograph of the back of one of those pictures. And it shows a photograph of uniforms taken by Kim Campbell. That means the uniforms themselves were seized by Campbell uh, on the night of the 31st of October, 1868. And it goes on to say that, that they're Ku Klux Klan robes and they're sort of repetitive, but that's what you get from the back. So you know a little bit about the context from what people wrote on the pictures. And this was a common thing to do. So here we have two figures in KKK disguises. And then uh, here we have one that was altered because this one has the letters scratched in the emulsion that show you it's the KKK. With the report, you wouldn't need the letters because the report itself would tell you who the people were and what the circumstances were. In other words, they'd provide the context. Here, if you've got a, just a picture by itself, you have to have some way to know that these are KKK people rather than just men getting out of bed. So that's what the letters are there for. Can we see the next one? One of the strangest of these photographs that turned up is one that has been printed backwards so that where you expect the picture to be light, it's dark. And for instance, the mask-like coverings on the faces of these hooded characters are dark. And because of that, they look more menacing than they do in the bright light of the studio. But you can tell that this was an original, uh, originally a 
normal kind of picture rather than a reverse one because around the edge where there's a little double line that little double line is dark against light just the way it would be in a regular normal picture but in this particular picture it's backward why not reverse course maybe it's another joke we don't know and at that particular time I didn't know either I thought it was odd and I thought it would challenge most photographers to go through the tedium of doing the reversal and printing it but I didn't really know any more about it than that next please so, so, so here we have three images and they're all based on the same negative the one at the far left is the original with no letters the one in the middle has the letters added so you would have some context. And the one on the right, maybe it's a joke, maybe it's meant to look more menacing. It's hard to interpret that one. But to, to have three images, each different and each based on the same uh, negative is quite unusual. So what, what are you gonna make of something like this? Well, what it made me do was go to the internet and query about 80 different archives and libraries in the United States that were already in formation uh, during Reconstruction to just see if they had any images that looked like this. And I turned up some in the most amazing places, uh, different uh, ones. One turned up two weeks ago from a collection in New Jersey and it shows these guys just as they are here, except that it's offset a little bit. They're not centered the way they are centered so tidily in these images. And the person who owned that picture believed, and I, I agree with them, that this was probably a first picture that was taken and it turned out when they developed it, that it was offset a little. It didn't look as nicely composed as these look. And it was, so it was reshot. And what you're looking at are the retakes. Can so we, we've next? got these three images now, right? And 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 as I think you've hinted, this is this is not the end of the story. So so what happens next with with these? What happens next is that a copy of this print was sent to Harper's Weekly Magazine, which is the most read magazine in the United States at this time, with a weekly circulation of more than 100,000 copies. And that doesn't even count the ones that were sold on newsstands that uh, Harper's didn't keep track of those. But they assume that 100,000 people subscribed. And in addition to that, there were four pass-throughs for each newspaper. So that would be maybe 500,000 people saw this image. In modern terms, it went viral and it had to have been done without the use of direct photography because photography didn't have the ability at that time to be processed and printed on the same printing press as text. And text was much more important or thought so. So anyway, these people decided that they would print this picture in Harper's. And in addition, they would put a caption on it to provide the context that would explain why they took it. And so down here at the bottom, it says that these people are members of the KKK. Well, why would Harper's do that? Harper's didn't have to do anything like that to keep its circulation numbers high. It, I think that, that, that he did it so that the images of these people would be disapproved of, that once people realized they were KKK people, they would oppose them. And I think that that's the reason that the caption was put that way. But it's wrong. It's, these are not... KKK members, the KKK members had gone out the back window of the calaboose. They were no longer available. So uh, these have to be somebody else. And But the Harper's Weekly Magazine is proof positive of a theory that I have about phot photography in general. And that is if there's only one photograph available of something, 
it's going to be used over and over and over again. The photograph, the first photograph that was taken of a football game between Auburn and the University of Alabama is one of the worst photographs I have ever seen. It's blurry and fuzzy and it was taken in bad circumstances, almost at dusk. And yet it is turns up so often on the web I'm sure I've seen it thousands of times because it's the only one. And because it's the only one, it gets used. So this was the only one that most people knew. And I was very interested that the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery has a print of this. And they think it's, they still believe it's KKK people in spite of being shown the step-by-step refutation of that. So these people... Uh, got a notoriety that meant that this image was desirable. And so Robinson and Murphy were into a business where they could print more versions of it and make more money, uh, which they certainly did do. Curiously enough, if you needed a KKK picture, and this was the only one, you used it just the same way. And there was another incident completely unrelated to the courthouse in Huntsville that took advantage of the fact that this was a purported KKK picture. And that was in connection with arrests that were made after an incident at a place called Cross Plains, Alabama. Cross Plains is just west of what is now Gadsden, Alabama. Gadsden was a dot on the map back then and Cross Plains was a thriving little town with a railroad station that was a building. The railroad was going from Selma to Rome, Georgia, but wasn't quite finished. Because it wasn't finished, they still needed some white staff. Their charter of the railroad insisted that some of the people who were hired for the railroad be black. And those black people needed to have led lessons in English and writing and reading. They needed to help build the depot. They were needed to build a workers village. So a, a white man was hired to be the superintendent of those activities. And his name was Luke. And Mr. Luke came down from Canada, white Canadian to uh, do these jobs. He was not popular because he wanted to help the black people and the people in the Cross Plains vicinity couldn't have cared less. He walked into a situation that was both volatile and dangerous without any preparation at all. And when the local people realized that he had sold uh, a gross 12 dozen pistols to the black people, they went bananas. They came into a temporary place where he had been incarcerated waiting for judgment about the guns. They drove him out, drove him through the town and made sure that he was lynched before he could tell his story. So he was lynched. Five black men were also lynched and the sixth one was lynched a little bit later after that. There were 140 testimonies that were given at the pretrial. And there were people who could name the perpetrators of the lynching with their complete names, addresses, all the information you could possibly want about them. Yet there was no arrests and there was no arraignment. And the reason was probably that the people believed that the justice had been done already with the lynchings. And now our expert on lynching is going to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so so as as I think other viewers to this series know, this is uh, this is what I work on in this period. And um, and and lynching evolved, particularly in reconstruction and and certainly in Alabama. Um, during this period as um, a, a communal punishment and it evolved, which it had been before and really evolved into um, a, a form of terrorism and a form of terrorism 
that was um, directed largely at Black people and directed lar- and and directed secondarily at the allies of Black people, like Mr. Luke, um, like other sort of radical Republicans who uh, were intent on on helping the the continued passage of Reconstruction. And so the the Huntsville or the, the the Cross Creek lynching is is one of just dozens that we know about in Alabama during Reconstruction, which um, which only sort of served to to heighten the power of of images like the one that Francis is talking about here. People um, came, as I sort of suggested at the beginning, came to understand the Klan as as the, the, the perpetrators of lynchings, as the people that would uphold the kind of racial and social order. And so um, anytime they even see uh, images of, of purported, um, alleged, was, as we know now, not actual Klan members uh, that we see here, there would be you know, even more of a, a kind of sharing of that, that kind of terror. Um, and, and as Francis suggests, uh, the vast majority of these lynchings went unpunished, even when um, we, we know who the perpetrators were, we know who participated in it. And, and I think that just suggests how, um, how acceptable in many ways this practice uh, kind of came to be. But I want to get us kind of back back on, on track, right? And, and back thinking about um, how the, the Klan and how the, the media um, uh, at the time and various forms of media uh, continued to, to kind of spread this, this message. So can you tell us a little bit more uh, about that, Francis, and how, how this is happening uh, at the time through visual media? Well, you wonder how the picture was connected to the lynching. And the answer is that we have data that tell us about it, newspaper accounts and uh, some marvelous research that was done by a a lay historian who just was doing it for his own entertainment. Uh, And they tell the story of what, what happened. And what happened was that these, uh, this photograph that you're looking at now, a version of it showed up in one of three letters that were accumulated by someone who had attended the trial or the pre-trial. These three letters were each written by a different person to someone who is prominent in the community in the White Plains area. And these people were told what to write. They were told to write threatening letters that frightened the officials and the people that they sent the letters to into doing what the KKK wanted them to do and in effect throwing the election. So what happened was that one of these included the photograph and if a photograph fell out of one of these envelopes, you would probably be terrified. In an era when people believed in a literal hell, they promised that hell mouth would open with flames and, and sharp things and, and kill people that, that were uh, recipients of the letters. Two out of three of these men who received the letters were family men. They had children, young children. And to have a terrifying picture like this that threatened the KKK's retribution on you if you didn't mind do what the KKK said to do, that would have been especially terrifying back in the 19th century. So we believe that one of those letters contained not only the threatening message, but the photograph as well. The reason there were messages that threatened people with death and destruction and hellfire was because the idea of wearing a disguise had been discarded by the government. There were state laws and national laws against wearing disguises, except in very specific conditions and mostly in uh, blackface entertainment. So, These people who 
received the letters were people who would, were pillars of their community, influential gentlemen, like the postmaster who was very prominent citizen. And so when they uh, were terrified enough to do what the KKK wanted them to do, they could be sure that other people in the community would follow suit. So that's another use of this image in a context that has nothing to do with its original creation. But what's left of a way to, to get the KKK's message across? Well, of all things, the lowly postcard was one of the ways that they used. At the turn of the century, postcards became not only the primary means of communication in this country, sort of like text messaging. You would send one if your train was going to be late. You'd say, oh, I'm going to make the 815. Can you pick me up there anyway? Uh, so postcards were a big communications mode, and they were used for all kinds of purposes. Interestingly enough, most of them were never postmarked, never mailed, and the, they were kept as souvenirs of one kind or another. And this is an instance of it, although what I'm showing you isn't the front. You've seen enough fronts of two guys in disguises. Uh, this is the backside of a postcard that was produced by LSU, uh, Louisiana State University. The history department decided to issue a set of postcards that showed scenes of, of reconstruction. And people bought them and mailed them around. But like most postcards, they were not used for their political weaponry that, that they boasted on the front side. They were just used for doing little tasks like a, a cell phone can do with text messaging. This one was sent with, by a Mr. Bonham Jr who was at that point teaching summer school at LSU. Um, he sent this postcard to a man named Professor Andrews who signed his name or somebody signed his name there, but you can't read it because the, the postal, the pencil writing is so pale. The, the Professor Andrews normally taught at Tufts University in Boston, but he was teaching at Columbia University that summer but he could be reached through an organization called the NEHTA. Well, what's amazing is that organization from the turn of the century is still going strong. It's the oldest uh, teaching association in the United States. And it's still, as I said, they, they have regional meetings and national meetings the National New England History Teachers Association. So he, they, they knew it would get to him. How would the postman know? Heaven only knows. But this one was never mailed. He may have just kept it to give to his friend later on. At this time, people who taught history were beginning to learn that to have show and tell kind of elements in the history curriculum helped people learn history. Maps, for instance, were very prominent in this period. Postcards, very, very prominent. Um, people writing pretend letters to pretend congressmen. There are all sorts of ways you can do it, but most of them were already known to the early 20th century. And what's interesting to me is that these postcards were issued by people who belonged to this association and whose officers were imp important men in their states. Thomas Owen, who was the director of the State Archives, was an officer of this, uh, the NEHTA at this time. And it's no, no telling what he learned didactically that he could take and put in his new archive to teach history to people. So there's, by this time, people were no longer trying to persuade you that the, uh, <clears throat> that the um, message that the KKK was a, a wonderful uh, organization that rescued damsels in distress and did only good things for the community. That view of the Klan was certainly out there. And it was, it was in preparation for the 
arrival of novels and movies about the Klan, including Birth of a Nation, a toxic movie that uh, many people base their attitudes about race and color and prominence uh, on that sort of thing. So what we have here is a, a picture that underwent a surprising number of transmogrifications, as they say in the Episcopal Church. They altered, they altered history and they helped to change people's attitudes about history. So we have an image that started out as a, a, a piece of history that was trying to persuade someone who was reading a report that an incident had really happened. A joke, here's Ku Kuxley, uh, another way of looking at this. Uh, a picture to scare little children and their parents into doing wrong things. And finally, a didactic mode of teaching history to uh, people who might have otherwise had a, more trouble learning it. So those are, those are the things that this picture tells. And it tells them in a way that is different from any other Alabama photograph I have ever seen. And I have seen more than 200,000 photographs made in Alabama. And so I'm a little bit of an expert on that. But what I do understand is that photography was fairly new at this time. It had only been invented in the 1830s. It was only 40 years or so old. And it was already beginning to have an influence on the cultural life and the material life of the people who bought them and had them framed for their hallways and such. So that's all I have to say. I wanted to put a sort of human face on the reconstruction because it's such a difficult period to wrap your mind around. There's such achievements in pottery and quilting and other folk arts. And at the same time, it's a terrifying era from the point of view of somebody who's having to live through it. So I'll turn it back to you, uh, Elijah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. I, you know, and I think to, to, to summarize again and put it in the broader context of this series, you know, I think that what we're seeing is that this image gets caught up not only in, in the way that people understand reconstruction at the time, but increasingly it gets caught up in the way that, that people remember reconstruction later and learn about reconstruction later. Um, and, you know, I, I think uh, we, we've talked a lot in this, um, in this series, both about history, what actually happened and about memory and historiography, right? The way that that both uh, historians and common people sort of understand what happened in Reconstruction. And I think just to kind of add to um, to what you're talking about here, I think it's worth saying that the the, the foremost proponent of of Reconstruction history as um, as this this sort of failure of of of, um, of black political actors and this sort of triumph of the Ku Klux Klan uh, over, over, um, you know, over, over black people and their allies was Walter Linwood Fleming. Um, who's, well, who's, my feeling who's, is that right. there will be more of these photographs will turn up as we look at our history again through a new lens of the 2021, uh, we'll be able to see more uh, examples of KKK in industry and activity, more persuasion. We're already seeing it. And it's not that different from what was happening during Reconstruction. Some people think history does nothing but repeat itself. And with this particular subject, you do believe there's some truth to that. Well, I, I think that's that's really well said, and um, we're we're at the the end of our time, um, and and I just want to thank you for this really fascinating uh, fascinating talk, and I, I know uh, everyone else at Landmarks and um, and at Alabama Humanities Alliance uh, will will agree. Thank you so much for for doing this, Francis, and uh, thanks everybody for for watching.